trying to do today is so that we can hear your questions and so that on the DVDs and uh, what we're going to do is pass around a microphone it's a radio handheld mic you'll need to hold it very close to your mouth uh, for volume so that we can actually hear what your what your question is so when you put up your hand and I say and I point to you if uh, you could grab the microphone or just put it leave your hand up while the microphone is coming to you so and uh, we'll just have the mic there so that you can say what you need to say into it. Do you really walk up and down the minutes? Yeah, maybe just that would be lovely. Thanks. Uh, what was the other? Uh, remember to make a donation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Peter says remember to make a donation. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to make a donation. But uh, if you do want to, where, where is it, Peter? The, uh, the box is outside, or if they want to make it on a credit card, we've handed out a slip. No worries. Um, and if you want to order any DVDs as usual, um, that's all available somewhere, I think, isn't it, outside? Just outside. And uh, Peter, again, a lot of this stuff Peter is doing at his own cost, by the way. So, so like, there's been like seven or eight or nine thousand dollars worth of DVDs printed already, hasn't there? Um, so it's your donations that, uh, and you're covering the cost of those that helps that continue. So, um, all of these sessions will continue to record as well. So how are you feeling today? And all of you know what the subject is about today. So the first part of the subject is about just an informal discussion. And what I what I want to do is break these sessions now into two into two uh, sessions. One two hours of these basically. The first session in every day that we do will be in more of like an informal session, and uh, and usually it will be focused on emotions. So it will be helping you connect emotionally, talking about emotions that you're facing and things like that. And I want to go through uh, what I've noticed has been many, ex many people's experience on the Divine Love Path, just to give some reassurance as well, that when you go through certain stages in your own development, that uh, you understand what's actually happening. And then the second session will be more formal, and the subject of that is Reincarnation Day. And who managed to read the uh, document I sent out? It's a long document, 100 pages, I didn't expect everyone to read it. So some of you know. How many of you found that interesting? You found that quite fascinating? Yeah? Oh, I loved it. You loved it? Okay. So um, there have been quite a lot of things that would have come up for many of you in that. So in terms of emotions and beliefs. So today we're going to confront some belief systems that, uh, that you may have and we'll try to deal with those as well today. So that's our day today. So the first thing I'd like to talk to you about is this process that happens of opening up emotionally. And most of you, and you will find, are still flirting with the emotional process. Is that how you're finding it? How many of you feel like you're totally in it, like totally immersed in it now? Quite a few, All right? So there's a few. How many of you still feel like you're flirting with it, sort of in and out, in and out? Okay, so. Quite, quite a lot of us are still flirting with it. And, and what I would like to do today is talk about that, talk about why that happens and how that happens and what's actually going, in, going on inside of you at the soul level so that we can understand better 
what's happening so that when we come up with different problems in this process, and there will be problems with this process inside of you, when you come up with these problems inside of you, that you understand that other people are going through the same things, that you understand what's actually happening for you. So it's really important that uh, we cover some of those things. So what I've noticed is this. Remember quite some time ago, I drew two scales. One of them I called the, uh, the fear truth scale, if you like. Remember that? Yep. And the other one, can anyone remember what that was? The pain, pleasure scale. Okay. So, every time, we remember what we said at the time was, any time the fear is greater than the pain, there is a high likelihood you will not deal with your emotions. Remember we said that? Yeah. And then we said, when the pain gets greater than your fear, then most often you will start connecting with your emotions. You will start wanting to deal with your emotions. So how many of you have already noticed that happening in your life? Have you noticed that going on? So quite a number. How, how it seems like you're afraid to deal, afraid to deal, afraid to deal, but then the pain gets so great that you just feel like you're forced into dealing. And then when you're forced into dealing, what do you notice about fear after that point? Do you notice it seems to go down, it seems to lessen? So the fear has a tendency to lower every time you go break through those barriers? Alright, well what I want to do is talk more about that process and, and, and you can relate your own experiences with this but just remember the microphone is going to have to be used today so if you feel a bit uncomfortable with that then, uh, get over it. then get over it. <laughs> Absolutely. We all want to hear your experience. Okay, let's look firstly at this guy. fear truth scale. Most of us have huge amounts of fear that we are unaware of in our lives. Now they, they generally surround issues like what do people think of me? What, am I, what do I really look like to other people? And so many of these fears not only are surrounding those issues, but underneath that issue is a deeper issue of what do I really feel about myself? How do I really, you know, feel or think about myself as well is a big issue. And often we do not want to address our fears. And this is why the pain seems to be a necessary part in the process. But is it, but is it an essential part? What do you think? Why? We could volunteer. We could volunteer. Yeah. So, what, remember, quite a few of you did the um, thing in Mulaney, the, the little intensive we had. And remember, one of the things I said there was that fear is your friend. Mm -hmm. What did I mean by that? Anyone want to put up a hand? Can you remember what I meant by fear is your friend? Fire away. I could give you an example. On Monday afternoon, my boss walked into the shop and he said, I'm sorry, but your job is ending at the end of February. Yeah. I went into great fear. Yeah. But then the fear was um, the catalyst for me to say, well, okay, I've got fear, so I'm going to have to really get into my emotions here and experience them. Mm. So on the way home Monday night, I yelled and screamed and I hit the steering wheel and I felt and I cried a lot and yeah. I felt a lot better when yeah. I got home and then I cried some more when I got home. And then Wednesday, a friend told me about a job. I had an interview this morning and everybody keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> In March, I'll be stepping into another job that will be just perfect for me. So yeah. it, was, it was a reminder to me to get into the emotions of it. Yeah. And as soon as you get into the emotions of it, your law of attraction changes. So that's the thing to remember. If your law of attraction is not changing, and we'll have another informal session where I'll talk about the law of attraction, but if the law of attraction isn't changing, then it means you're not processing the causal emotion 
who attracted those events in the first place. So that's a very good example. So if you decided to live in your fear, do you know what I mean by live in your fear rather than go through your fear? For most of us, what we have a tendency to do is live in our fear. So remember last time we got together before Christmas, I said that we tend to go through this process of hearing the truth and the soul sings. Remember I said that? And then what happens after the soul sings for a while? The soul sinks. And why does the soul sink? Because we've got to really look sincerely at why it does. Because it's one of the major blockages for your progression. Is getting out of that soul singing part, which is really wonderful, isn't it? When, the, when you're hearing truth and it's really resonating with you, it feels wonderful, you feel happy, joyous, you feel uplifted, you feel encouraged, you feel like you want to progress, you feel really enthused. But when the soul goes into the sink area, what happens there? Oh, I don't know if I can do this. You know, no, I want to avoid any person who's doing this. <laughs> you want to avoid life even sometimes, don't you? And definitely avoid AJ because he's a major pain in the neck of <laughs> So what I find is what most people do is they go through this process firstly. And if I draw it now sort of like a, a point points on a progression of time. So firstly, the soul sings as we said. During that phase, if you like, and that phase may last a little while, for me it lasted about two weeks, I think. Um, but for many, it lasts much longer. Come in and there's some seats here down the front there. Um, how many of you found the soul singing phase quite a long period? Right, so quite a number, that's quite good. How many of you found the soul singing was about you know, the time you watch the DVD or something like that. And then after that you went into some emotions. How many of you found that happening? So quite a number of it there. It all depends as to what's getting triggered inside of you as to what will happen. And also it all depends on many cases how long you're willing to hold on to emotions that are inside of you that you don't want to release that are in opposite to love. Because it, sometimes we can hold on to those emotions by suppressing them so much that we don't finish up that we don't finish up dealing with them and we try to we try to stay in this soul singing phase for a long time in order to feel good. Because what do we like doing? We like feeling only good. We don't like feeling uh, painful emotions, we just like feeling pleasurable emotions. So that period it will will often last some time when a person first hears truth. Then we kick into this other phase where some things start happening. One thing that starts happening is judgment. Now, how many of you have started the soul singing process, right? started seeing the truth of what's going on, and then saw yourself in the mirror for the first time in your life and then started saying to yourself, wow, I've got some major, major problems inside of me. <laughs> uh, and then what you did, straight after that, is went into judgment of those major problems inside of you. How many of you have found that happening? Right, so the majority of us have found that happening. All right, now, why does that happen? What, what's your idea of why that might happen? Why are they? Because we're conditioned to blame somebody and it's easiest to blame ourselves. Yes, that's very true. You will either do one of two things when you get into judgment. One is to blame everyone else other than yourself. Or well, the second one is to blame yourself. Now, for most of us, when we were growing up, when we were tiny children, our, we finished up getting lots of blame from parents. So in the process of getting lots of blame from parents, we then learned to blame ourselves. And so we go straight away into this judgment of self. 
Now, judgment of self is one of your major problems that you will have in terms of your own resistance to dealing with emotion. Because let's, let's face it, for example, here, here's, here's something. Let's say during our childhood something happened with our relationships, with our family and our parents and so forth, that we finished up having a, a feeling inside of us that we like children sexually. Now, how many people would openly admit to that kind of an emotion? Very few, eh? Because what, there's huge problems with openly admitting that in today's society, isn't there? Okay. Now, if you have that emotion inside of you, what do you do with that? Well, most of the time we'll go into judgment about it. If we're not acting upon it already, we, we usually do the opposite. We go into judgment about it. So instead of actually dealing with the causal emotion, which is underneath the judgment, what we finish up doing is staying in judgment, which prevents us from the emotional, having the emotional experience. Can you see how that works? Let's say you also have a problem with anger. Let's say inside of yourself, you've always condemned people who are angry. So how many of us feel anger is a bad thing? Like, really? Uh, I used to feel that quite a lot, so I put my hand up there. And then you've gone into the state of saying, anybody who gets angry is a bad person. Just start going down that track. Now, when we, when we get confronted in the soul singing period of, our, of this divine truth experience, if you like, what happens is we start coming to a full <coughs> realisation, a full picture of what we are. Then the next step is, anything that's so-called bad in our own eyes about what's inside of us, we will now judge. And in the process of judging it, what do we do? We shut down the underlying emotion. We don't experience the underlying emotion. We ignore it. Does that make sense? And this is happening for many of you. This is why many of you sort of skip out of the emotions. Because instead of allowing the emotion to be present without judgment, most of the time there's huge judgment about the emotion before you even get to experience the emotion. Now, I had this ma major problem for many, many years of my own processing. And it took a long time before I realised that I had to do, with judgement, you were actually doubling up your workload and you're actually creating your own resistance to your emotions with judgement. When I say doubling up your workload, you first have to work through the issue of why you're judging yourself and then, after you've dealt with that, then you get to work through the issue of what you were judging in the first place. Which is doubling up all of your emotional processing. If you can release judgement from the whole process, when, then what will happen? You are only focusing on the emotion itself. How do you do that? Well, the question was how do you do that? How do you release judgement? And there are a number of ways. How many of you feel that you've released judgment from your pro emotional processing work? Would you like to comment about how you feel you've done that? So, would you, anyone? Just thanks. Just, just, just going to have to hold it close. Just by the recognition that it's a judgment has helped me. It's like, oh, I'm judging myself. Great. Right. All right. So every time you've noticed yourself judging yourself, you've actually told yourself that you're judging. You're, you're, you're recognising it. I just recognise that I'm doing it. Yep. Okay. So you're observing your own judgment of yourself. Yeah. Okay. And okay, just right up the back. Yeah. You have to hold it quite close. I've done it by um, being aware of the child at the, at the point at which, or just the general awareness of the time when I took on that judgment or the hardness of my life, and being aware of that. Good. So, so basically, it's having compassion for the fact that the child got all that judgment yeah. in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 
Good. Anyone else? I, uh, I had a pretty big um, issue come up for me. Um, Where's uh, about some truth about some actions that were really not very nice, and um, and I felt that I needed to feel some remorse. And I couldn't. <laughs> Why can't I feel this? And um, I looked through some of the notes that I've written that you have um, given us. And uh, you did mention this thing about judgment. I'm like, okay, I'm going to look at the judgment that I have about feeling remorse about my actions. Yeah. And apart from it being very emotional, when I just started writing up lots of things that seemed to be blocking me, feeling that feeling, yeah. um, it all came tumbling out. And I did and then have the judgment, oh my God, look at all this crap. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it, it really helped me look at, at what was holding me back. And there were a lot of other issues that I really um, needed to go into as well, and I didn't know were there. Yeah. So my judgment, looking into the judgment, illuminated a lot of other things with me. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And allowed me to go into that feeling. Yeah. So you could say, in summary of that, that you had to basically examine yourself very carefully and see what was going on. But you could also see that you had obviously you'd done you'd done something that you felt was wrong. Then you felt you should have been sorry, but you didn't feel sorry, and so then you judged yourself about that, and that was the whole sequence of events for you. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. 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 Anyone else like to? Um, I think I've, I've uh, my wife made me said no ideas. Yep. and done a lot of work with her on um, judgmental behaviour. Yep. Um, but uh, not having judgment on myself sort of stopped me feeling frustration and not being able to achieve something. Um, but I treat it like I would treat my nine-year-old son, you know, he's just learning his time's table, I'm not going to expect him to do calculus. So, uh, you know, I'm still on a journey. Yeah, with many things yet to learn. So if I start judging myself now, expecting myself to do things that I have upset, sort of. Yeah. My own trip. So basically, it's uh, relaxing with the learning process, rather yeah. rather than expecting yourself to be perfect. Yeah. yeah. How many of you expect yourself to be perfect before you begin? <laughs> Common emotion. <laughs> yeah. So what happens during this phase here, which is the soul really starting to sink phase? is we, we, in this phase here, we get presented with a lot of truth, right? Some of that truth is universal truth. Other parts of that truth is personal truth. Now, universal truth is generally quite easy to accept. Why is that? It's because we don't have any emotional investment in it. Does that, that make sense, doesn't it? But personal truth, that's very difficult to accept. And the main reason why that is, is because we're so used to judgment. We're so used to judging everything that we hear about ourselves. And usually what do we do when we hear something bad about myself and somebody said it? We normally go into, oh, you are a nasty person. How dare they ever said that about me? I am black man then from my list of friends. And, you know, we just go down this road, don't we, of trying to actually remove that person, in fact, usually from our life, in order to just avoid that projection or that truth, if you like. And so this is the main problem we're facing, is that we're actually judging, when we judge, we're actually judging the truth. Can you see that? And if you keep judging your tr the truth, you are not going to feel emotions. The reason why is to actually feel any emotion we must first feel the truth. Now does everyone understand what I just said because it's so important to understand. You must feel the truth before you will actually feel the emotion. You must actually 
believe a, and actually state and feel this truth before the emotion will flow. Example. And I'll give you a very physical example. You're standing in front of the mirror in the morning and there's a bit of sleep, you know, in the corner of your eye and you know, running down here from the night from the night. And maybe there was a bit of a drinking night the night before and you're looking pretty worse for wear and the hair's a bit of a mess and, and everything like that is happening. There's your picture right in front of you. What do you normally do with that picture? Oh, this is looking pretty bad. Some patch-ups have to occur, right? If you're a woman, you slap, slap on the mask maybe. If you're a guy, then you shower and maybe a shave and, you know, some of those anti-after-effect uh, type, um, what do you call them, concoctions that you might drink. And just in order to pep you up. Now, why do you do all of that? You do it all because you want to look better even to yourself, don't you? And this is a common thing that we have inside of ourselves going on, is that we always want to present to ourselves a better picture than what we really are. Now, can you see a problem with that on the divine path? Yeah? Can you see that from God's perspective, what is God seeing? The absolute truth. Exactly as you are. What they say, warts and all. You see everything. You see, that's what God's saying. If we were going to become a one with God, what will we finish up saying? Everything, warts and all. Not only in ourselves, but in everyone around us too, right? We will eventually start seeing what God says. Now, if I have some judgment about that, that's going to really affect, isn't it, my own progression so much, but also it's going to affect my projections of emotions onto other people as well. Now, if I accept the truth emotionally inside of myself, and I have an open heart, and all I'm doing is focusing every single day on seeing the reflection in the mirror, that I'm getting reflected back at me through the law of attraction. So remember the law of attraction is like a mirror. It's reflecting at you constantly what you've got left inside of you and also the good things inside of you too, of course, isn't it? It's reflecting both at you constantly. Now the good things we're totally happy about taking responsibility for, aren't we? Like how many of you, you know, if somebody, if you had a hundred people saying, oh, she's a lovely woman, you know, you'd be pretty happy with that. <laughs> But if you had a hundred people saying, well, you know, she's a real bitch, actually. You know, I don't really like spending any time. But that would be pretty challenging, wouldn't it? Right. So when we look at the mirror, the key is firstly, we, go, we need to see our truth. We need to look at our truth sincerely. Once we see that, the key is to not walk away and forget it. And you will be very tempted to walk away and forget it because you'll do this when you see the, yourself in the mirror. You'll do this judgment thing. Every time you judge, you are resisting the truth. Every time you resist the truth, the emotion that the truth will open up will not flow. The emotion will only flow when you accept the truth. Now that applies whether I have harmed someone else or someone else has harmed me. Now most of us are totally comfortable, are we not, in dealing with the emotions where we have, where other people have harmed us. You find those pretty easy to deal with? You know, when I was three, mum did this and dad did that and it was terrible and you know, I'm pretty happy to cry about that. When I say happy, I don't know if you use the right term, that was the right term, but you can cry about those kind of issues quite easily, can't we? But what about when you have harmed others? Or when others come to you and tell you that you've harmed them? How do you react then? With even more judgment. With even more judgment? Or often with the opposite? Denial. Denial and blame. Justification. Justification. One of those two. Is that? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that, this is the best time to look for causal emotion. The best time is to look for it as soon as soon as the event occurs, straight away flick into causal emotion. But for the majority of us, what we finish up doing is judging first, which switches us right out of the causal emotion. It gets us right away from it. In the end, every single causal emotion within us began usually in our first 10 years of our life. Now. Would you judge a you know seven year old child coming to you saying, "Mummy or Daddy, um, you know, I really felt like killing one <laughs> the guy, you know, when I was at kindy today or at school today." Uh, would you judge that? Wouldn't you just sit them down and help them work through the emotion? You wouldn't punish them, would you? You wouldn't slap them across the face. You naughty. You wouldn't do any of those things, would you? But how many times do you do that with you? You see that you see why we shut down so much. So, in this soul sinking phase, one of the main reasons why the soul is sinking is because of the judgment that we have about truth, and not so, not so much the judgment we have about global or universal truth, <coughs> but it's the judgment that we have about personal truth. Um, can I just get my mic first? Thanks, Chris. Um, in my early life, I always thought, you know, I was brought up on judgment. Yeah. So I thought that was the truth. Yeah. That's what I thought it was. Yes, and now that's... Now I know it's not. Exactly. But I've always thought I was truthful. Yes. Very good. Yeah, so, so you grew up feeling that the judgment of yourself was the truth about yourself. Mm. Yeah. But all of us have done that, haven't we? Pretty yeah. much. This is why we revert to judgment. It seems so real and it's taken me all my life to find with your teachings to get out of it. Yes. Mm. Yeah. It's impossible. It keeps coming back. It seems normal. Yeah. And that's what I'd like to talk about next. Yeah, I would. All right. Because it's really important to understand that even the judgment came from somewhere. Right. And it is also important to understand that when we start getting past this soul sinking phase and into the actual processing part of our emotions, we start realizing that it's so important for us to realize that the, this young time of our life or actually caused us to believe errors as truth. So many of you right now have all of these feelings about yourself that are not true, but you believe with all of your heart they're true. Now, God knows they're not true, but you don't know they're not true. And can you see that? That's pretty hard, isn't it? Because I've got all these feelings about myself. Oh, I'm getting a bit wet there, aren't I? I've got all these feelings about myself. Sorry about this, but it's the way it goes today. And we've got all these feelings about myself that is actually ha that, that's going on constantly, and I believe them to be true. And that's pretty sad, really, when you think about it. And it also makes our life very difficult when I'm hearing divine truth or hearing truth or we're attempting to hear truth from God but in reality what's going on inside of us is we're constantly rejecting it because we believe what we're hearing is false and this is why most people and tomorrow one of the things I want to talk about in the informal discussion is ang anger and what, what happens with anger but this is why most people get into anger we get angry because we hear this, what we believe is error, but actually it's probably truth right, that we're hearing. And we get angry, we respond in anger, which is denial emotion generally, to the experience instead of allowing ourselves to see. And the reason why we don't allow ourselves to see is because we judge ourselves. So can you see how it sets up this huge cycle of resistance? To the emotion and the more you resist your emotion the less connection you will have with God 
So the more you actively resist your emotion, the less connected you will be with God. And the key indicators that we're resisting our emotion is if I'm angry, feeling resentful, feeling rage, feeling shut down, and a lot of those other types of emotions, then I'm in a space of resisting my emotions and I need to allow myself to see the truth of that. Does that make sense? Uh, just Tris. Just right close, you need a close. Just going on the resistance, um, the denial leads to resistance, etc. Um, and resistance leads to anger, which is the opposite of the emotion. So when we resist our emotion, we can feel the emotion, but we can't see the emotion. It's a vicious circle. And leads to more resistance, leads to more anger, leads to more conflict, etc. And yeah, it's hard to get out of that circle. It is very difficult. But you have to sit in it and recognize it and listen to it. Yeah. Yeah. Carol? <coughs> AJ, ask people to speak a bit louder, would you? I just need to hold the mic. You'll have to hold the mic right by your lips. AJ, now I'm not sure if I'm denying my emotion. I think I was when I came here today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I might be. Yeah. <laughs> um, knew on the day after Boxing Day when I did a five hour drive home late at night from um, a relative's birthday party that I got flashed twice by the speed zone. I thought I was doing really well, I didn't think I was speeding, but I was And I thought, okay, I've got two tickets. And then I see big signs and we're saying double the merits. I'm thinking, oh, no. yeah. <laughs> um, so I've been thinking they're going to come soon, but I was only going a little bit over speed, but maybe they won't arrive. And then um, three days ago, two came from New South Wales. Now I know there's one from Queensland coming too. I didn't get the second flash. Um, and, um, so there's now three of you coming. Yeah, no, I, I handled it by thinking, I'm just going for a walk. I'll look in the mailbox and um, saw them there and thought, I'll oh, just go and run. <laughs> I'll just leave them in the mailbox and go for a walk. <laughs> and then I thought, okay, the next time I've got to get them out. So you left him in there for a day, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got them to my desk. Um, I didn't want to spoil the soul singing, which yeah. <laughs> I got them to my desk. I've now read one. I don't know the other one's the same. And it's 12 merit points. 12. Yeah, which, which is all your points. Sorry? Which is all your points. This is all my points. Yeah. I got one to come. And you got one to come. So I'm thinking, okay. But my reaction to it, a while back would have been, oh my god, <laughs> this is terrible. But my reaction to it's actually not been that. Um, I'm thinking, oh well, you know, my speedo must be wrong because. Um, <laughs> 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 keep going, keep going. <laughs> this is good. But I'm serious that it must be wrong because yeah. I did look at my speedo when I got one of the flashes. Yeah. And I was not doing 15k's over, I know that. Yeah. Um, and I suspected for a but while. But you didn't slow down. <laughs> Well, I did. Oh, okay. that. I didn't see the second 60 moment. No, right. But I've sort of thought to myself, well, my brother sort of told me all different ways I can get out of all this, and I thought, no, I've got to be honest about this. And so I was driving, it was me. Um, and, well, okay, so what's wrong if I lose my license for a few months? I'm, I've got to be slowing down, haven't I? That's the way it's going to go. So I've actually accepted it. So I'm worried now that I'm actually going to deny it. <laughs> I don't really have a lot of emotion about it. I just feel that I'll be looked after and that I'm, I'm going too fast and I know that and that I need to slow down and my life is going to take that turn now anyway. And I thought, oh, well, that's all right. I'll do it. Just take that punishment. If I've got to lose my license, I've got to lose my license and find another way around it, but I'll be looked after and sure. So you notice, it. firstly, Carol, that you're thinking a lot. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but, yeah. The, the first feeling was, the, let's go back to the first feeling, yeah. which is, you know, you open your little yeah. ones and see them, and then you put it back down. Yeah. Now that straight away tells you that there's a fair bit being covered over inside of you. Mm -hmm. And what happened from then to the next day when you pulled out your mark was that you intellectualised it all the way. 
And in the process of intellectualizing it away, you've come up to some really, really good arguments. <laughs> but the truth is your law of attraction has just attracted 12 demerit points. So there must be an emotion. But, but AJ, my law of attraction in every other field is so good. No, see, see, now you're trying to justify <laughs> that your law of attraction is good in all these other places, so therefore you, you can ignore this emotion. Uh, <laughs> no, I was speeding. I must have been speeding. No, but that's not the emotion. Mm -hmm. can, can everyone see just for a moment? Is this, we're going to have long chats about the law, the law of attraction at some point, right? First thing with the law of attraction, you will be able to reason yourself out of it really easily. You will. You can do that. You can choose to do that. And most of us do that all of our life. We reason ourselves out, reason ourselves out. Oh, but it was this, and oh, but it was that, and oh, but I didn't see this, and oh, but... You know, we go through all of that, that, that whole process. But the truth is, these events were attracted by your soul emotion, not by anything else. Now the key is to allow that soul emotion to be triggered by these events. Now, there's a big soul emotion in here that you are totally unaware of that I can feel about it the instant you said about the demerit points. As soon as you said the word demerit points, there was this big emotion inside of you that you did not feel that I could feel. And this will, I, and I want to say this to the majority of you, will be like this with lots of issues. There will be lots of things go on in your own processing where you are, you feel totally unaware of what it is. And then all of a sudden, you'll come to a point of awareness. A point of what I would call intellectual realisation, that there is an issue. At the moment, you are not even allowing yourself to intellectually realise there's an issue because you're using all of the tools that you've learned from childhood about skipping over the law of attraction in order to avoid the actual emotion. Now the majority of us do this with all of our lives. Right? What we do is we have an event happen to us and then what we do is we use our head and we use, come up with all these different reasonings that we have inside of us to actually skip over the emotion that that law of attraction has been there forward to trigger. And we do this all the time. So this is what is happening with you with that issue. You feel here, you think here actually, that you've dealt with this issue. But if you had dealt with this issue, you would not have actually got any fines. Can you just justify yourself? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I see too much. And the, and then my life's too fast. And one of the reasons I left it in the mailbox is because I was going for a walk and I thought, this is the week I'm going to look up to myself. I'm going to go for a walk, I'm going to relax. So it's not the final even in the mailbox. <laughs> uh, what's the feelings you have inside of yourself about authority? Can I, can I just stop you for a moment? When I said that, did any of you actually feel what Carol's feelings were about authority. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to point out that that you can feel it when you say a word. There's a trigger word that goes on, and straight away there's a feeling that you feel from that person. And by the way, many of you have the same issue with authority. All right. So, so let's go on. Okay. My, my feeling then is that I don't think that they're always right. So. All right. Okay. Well, that's the truth. Is can I tell you how you really feel about authority? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You feel like rebelling against authority pretty often. In yeah. fact. You feel like rebelling against authority pretty often. In fact. The majority of the time if you can get away with it. <laughs> okay. That's the feeling that's going on inside of yourself. Now there's a reason for that. There's a deeper emotional reason inside of yourself about that. Can you see what it might be related to in your childhood? What what was your relationship with your dad and your mum? What kind of relationship? And who was the authority? Who, who was the authoritarian? Nobody really. There wasn't anybody around us at the time. It was mostly 
when they were around. Can you see how that all relates to this? What, how many of you feel that all the laws are just a big, like, superficial game? How many of you actually feel most of the laws that we have in the country are just a big superficial game? Okay. Well, I, I do. <laughs> and they are. The truth is they are. There are some laws that are beneficial, but what, what are laws generally doing? They are dealing with effects, aren't they? Very rarely dealing with causes. And because they're very rarely dealing with causes, of course they're just a game. And so what feeling then arises within you? I'm not playing this game, right? I'm not, I don't want to play this game. There's a lot of emotions in you about this, Carol. So much that you attracted three, <laughs> three fines in, what was it, one day? Four hours. Four hours, okay. Yeah. So there's a, some very deep emotions in you about this particular issue that you are now skipping over into the intellectual role of skipping over and saying, oh, but I don't have much trouble with it. If I lose my licence, I lose my licence. And, you know, I'll be able to work my way around that. And, you know, there's so many things going on inside of you intellectually, but skipping over this really, really large emotion from your childhood. It's also an emotion that's preventing your relationship with God. Now, can anybody see how that's related? It's an issue with authority preventing your relationship with God. Can anyone see what's going on there? See, if we see God's laws as authoritarian, what are we going to want to do to them? We want to break them, don't we? You want to break them. And how many of you feel like it's okay breaking God's laws? that you get away with it. Now most of us won't own up to that, right? But the truth is, most of us have that viewpoint inside of us. We do it all the time. We do it all the time. Yeah. Like, for instance, let's look at the law of love for a moment. If I loved animals, how many of you have pets? How many of you would consider eating them? But yet, how many of you who have pets, who wouldn't consider eating them, eat a cow? So what's that? Isn't that a feeling of rebellion against the law? On one hand you love one animal, but on the other hand you leave the other. Isn't there an issue there? Isn't there some kind of inconsistency there? Dogs are nice than cows. <laughs> Sorry, dogs are nice to tasting, did you say? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just said that. Not me. No, 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 no. <laughs> Can you see that? That's just one minor issue that I've just raised. But can you see how quite often on a daily basis we are being rebellious? We're being like children who want to break the rules. Where did that emotion come from? It has to have come from somewhere, doesn't it? And so generationally often we have these emotions impressed upon us and these kind of events are there to actually trigger those emotions so that we can release them so that we have a totally different viewpoint to authority. And in the end, so that we have a totally different viewpoint to God's authority. Because the truth is that God did create laws. What if some of the laws are a bit silly? Right? Sorry? What if the laws are a bit silly? Right? And who has the right to decide whether it's silly or not silly is an issue too, isn't it? But even if they are silly, then how about constructively addressing that issue compared to, you know, just breaking the law whenever you get the chance? Like, so, for, for example, many of us feel the taxation laws are silly, right? How many of you feel like you're really happy having, like, a third of your wages <laughs> or half of your wages or whatever go? Not many of us, right? So most of us feel, but how many of us still pay the tax? All of us, don't we? Pretty much. Now, why is that? Okay, we're not we're not willing to go through the truth of what would do if we really address this issue uh, individually or or collectively. That's that's why what it is. And these kind of issues are very very important issues in our relationship with God as well. 
Because from God's perspective, there is lots of laws that God has created for the smooth running of the universe. And all of us have this tendency to feel that we can break any of them because we got free will, right? But if we really loved, would you want to do that? Because all of God's laws are based around love. So if we really loved, would we want to break those laws? So these are emotional issues that we need to address. So the key thing looking back over this issue for yourself, Carol, is to go into the emotion that was triggered once you realised you were going to get fined and go deeper and deeper into this issue of authority. Because it's a large issue for you and in that there is this feeling or spirit of rebellion in you that's actually interfering with your relationship with God as well. And so all of these law of attractions are there to help you build your relationship with God in the end. And that's the key thing to bear in mind. And it's quite a large issue because you'll get some quite large fines coming up, sure. And possibility of much longer than three month uh, license uh, going. And you will start maybe reflecting more emotionally about the issue of authority. One of the other issues of the rebellion is that very often... Oh, sorry, James, can you just... Yeah, finish this. One of the other... The, the other side of rebellion is an often denied but ever-present fear of the repercussions arising from the rebellion. Yes. That's right underneath that. That's right. So often we've got deep fears that we need to release with regard to authority as well. Very much so. So how many of you only obey the law because you're afraid of getting caught if you don't? Right? How many of us feel that way? Like, so how many of you would gladly speed if there wasn't a law stopping you? So quite a lot of us, right? So, so we, can you see what's going on? We are afraid to be ourselves because of the repercussions of the law and so obviously we need to deal with some fears there too. So there's a lot of issues in that, one issue that you've just raised. Now, what you've done with it is intellectualise it all. And this is a thing that, that most people do on a regular basis with most of their law of attractions. So if you sit down on any one day, it's very rare for us to have a whole day where everything happened exactly as we wanted. Yes. Have, have, have any of you had a day like that? Right? It's a rare occasion. Like you look back on the day, if it happens like that, you think, wow, that was an awesome day. Right? <laughs> now, that will happen more and more as you deal with your emotions. You'll have more and more of those kinds of days. But the majority of us don't have those days, do we? What we have is all right from the moment we get up in the morning, something goes wrong with the kids, something goes wrong with the car, something goes wrong with this, something goes wrong with that. And these are all of our law of attraction, pulling in all of these events, telling us that there's emotions in me right now that I could choose to connect to if I wanted to and work my way through. And you know what I do with them most of the time? I just skip over them with a bit of mental, mental gymnastics and I'm in a new space and I don't need to worry about that. And you know what happens tomorrow? Often even the same thing, often even the same thing, and certainly in the week or whatever. It even, you will notice if you're observant about the law of attraction, the law of attraction is a beautiful law, but if you're observant about it, you will actually notice right down to tiny little time frames in your day, what's going on, what you were talking about, what happened when you were talking about that, all of these things, when you injure yourself. How many of you just had a little cut on your hand yesterday? A little cut on part of your body yesterday. I, I had a, a number yesterday. <laughs> they are all law of attraction events based around emotions going on within myself right at that moment. Right. And the key is to begin observing them. With the law of attraction, I've noticed that everything is emotional, no matter how small the mind you might see, everything is related to my emotions. That's it. Everything is related to an emotional cause within you. Everything. Every single event that's going on in your life. Now that being said, can you see how we often judge it? Say, no, that's somebody else's, that was this. No, that was only because I was doing this or doing that. 
and we just skip over the emotion of it. And remember this is about opening up emotionally, not skipping over emotions. So whenever you choose to skip over an emotion, what you're actually choosing is to keep your relationship with God distant. That's what you're choosing. You're allowed to choose that because you have free will. You're allowed to do that anytime you want. But do you want to keep doing this? Don't you want to have a different type, kind of life? Do you want to keep getting the same law of attraction every day? Do you want to keep having these same things go on and on and on? Well, obviously we don't. So let's change it, but deal with it emotionally. Now, how many of you have experienced the fact that you've dealt with an emotion and within a minute something has happened to tell you that you've just dealt with it? Does anyone want to say what that was? Or is it a bit scary? Justin, you want to say what yours? Yeah. There's a, a project at work that I thought I wanted to work on some while back. And so we flagged one of the managers, look, this is what I wanted to do. They came back and said, no, we've already emailed an external person to do that. So I went home, I cracked the complaint and whatever else. And then last week I started getting into some self-worth stuff. And I thought back to that and it was around, and at the time it was around, they don't think I'm good enough to do this. You know? And I didn't even get into the emotional process of pulling, but all I did was acknowledge it and I started to feel it. The next day, they came back and said, oh, the manager's changed their mind. Do you want the job? Do you want that project? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. <laughs> so so even, even just the intellectual realisation and a little bit of the emotion, straight away, things change. So you will find this happen on a regular basis in your life if you deal with the cause and emotions. If this doesn't happen to you, then it's because you are not dealing with the cause of emotion. There's no other reason. No other reason. Remember, the law of attraction is like the mirror that you get up in the morning and you look at your face here. And you see, you know, those marks and those blemishes and, you know, you can choose to actually feel them. Or you can choose to skip over them and ignore them. If you choose to feel them, you will in fact the very next day not have that reflection back at you. It, the reflection will stop instantly coming back at you. So each morning I look in the mirror and I see something different. And um, I judge it, and um, what I should be doing is actually looking deeper, what I feel by looking at, like whether it's the eyes puffed up, or, or suddenly I have an extra wrinkle, or um, something like that. Yeah. Because, as you said, by the next day, it disappears. And what I normally say to myself, it's either I've done something right yesterday, or the diet changed, or all these excuses, yep. but I haven't actually dealt with the... Um, Exactly. But I have a big issue today. Is um, law of attraction could be also that you cut your hair much shorter than you plan to? Because it goes up a lot of emotion in there. Totally. I, I didn't actually. But it, so, so the law of attraction wanted me to cut my hair shorter so that I could bring up some emotion. When you say the law of attraction wanted you, your soul, yeah, my soul. attracted a shorter haircut than what you wanted yeah. in order for this emotion to be triggered. Does that make sense? Now you can choose to get into it, cry. How many of you have had that? A haircut that you didn't want and you're really upset? <laughs> A lot of the women. That's great. Allow yourself to connect to that emotionally. And if you connect to that emotionally, you'll find all sorts of issues about unworthiness and lots of very, very core issues. Just driving here. Oh, yeah. Even not thinking that it's related to hair. That's right. And a lot of times it might not be related to the actual hair. And this is the problem with going through the, the issue intellectually. Is that you come up with a lot of intellectual ideas. But in the end, it might not be the real cause of the law of attraction emotion. So the key is to always go into the emotion. Because it's the emotion that created the law of attraction. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. And it's, yeah, it's, well, a lot of times the emotion is just right there on the surface, but we don't allow ourselves to connect to it. And that's the problem, that we have the emotion is being triggered, but we're trying to shut it down at the same time through judgment or something else. 
trying to shut it down. The key is to allow it to be triggered right at that moment. That is the best time to allow it. So how many of you know there was an emotion triggered sometime when you are at work and you decided you'll put it off to that evening? And then what happens that evening? I can't even remember it sometimes or, or what, ha what happens sometimes is uh, I can remember it but be blown if I can feel it now, you know. And so this is the thing we need to learn to allow yourself to feel it in the moment that it happens rather than putting it off and putting it off to some other time. I'll wait until you get up and back to the room. <laughs> Sorry. And then, then Mary. Uh, sorry, I just got to. So, something happens to you, say something happened this morning, and I get angry <laughs> about that. Now, just sitting in the anger, that's, that's an effect emotion, right? So, yep. I'm going to take that deeper and work out what that caused that, what feeling, what emotion caused that. And exactly. So, just when we just, how do you get from anger to there? This, oh, I get stuck in the middle there. It's like, you know, you're talking you guys going to be here tomorrow? Yeah. Oh, well, I'll talk about that tomorrow. Right. Yeah. But, uh, but just briefly, and it's a process of sinking in, sinking into the deeper emotions, and we'll talk about that as, as to how we actually go into those emotions. The key is to experience the anger rather than shutting it down. But don't be directed at anyone. Just experience it. And, and keep on saying to yourself while you're experiencing it that there's something underneath this that I'm trying to connect to as well. So, so what I do, like somebody mentioned earlier, bashing the, bashing the steering wheel in the car, screaming and getting upset with you. Because what that does is that's expressing the anger right there and then, but without actually pushing it onto somebody else. And it's experiencing the anger. When you experience the anger, you're now in the truth about the anger, which means the emotion that's underneath the anger will flow. And you'll find that if you allow yourself to do that, the emotion underneath will flow quite rapidly, generally. Now, some people have had to do that for three or four weeks, right? Every time they've been angry until the emotion underneath that anger flows. But after you've done it once or twice, there's a lot less resistance to it. And so you get into the stage where you don't even have any anger and you get straight into the underlying emotion. Remember that anger is the resistance block. And a lot of this process is about getting rid of resistances rather than feeling the emotions. Do you remember what you wanted to say then? <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, but I was going to say something that helped me with anger is um, recognising that this is my choice to feel powerful in this situation, so perhaps I'm avoiding a really powerless feeling. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that. It this morning, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that, applied to, that applied to this morning, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Anger, everyone heard that anger is a choice to avoid emotion, other emotions. So, and we'll go through that tomorrow. Go on, borrow it. Uh, I was going to say about the retraction. Yeah. Um, that it was really important realisation for me to, to sort of recognise, OK, I've got all of this stuff inside of me. And every single little event is your attraction to help me bring that out. And every time I ignore a little event or a little opportunity, it's only going to come back and it's likely to come back in a bigger and better way because I already ignored it. So yeah. it's kind of a perfect system. Yeah, I think. yeah it is a perfect system. Mm -hmm. How many of you have had that happen? Where You've ignored a little law of attraction, ignored another little law of attraction, and, on, and all of a sudden you have a big hammer. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah. uh, Tristan? Yeah, I think that's what happens when you don't allow yourself to feel that emotion. Yeah. So if you allow yourself to feel it, then you can feel it. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. It's okay to use the sign post. It's, yeah, and this is something I'd like to talk about the intellect. The intellect is very important actually in helping you connect emotionally. See, we've talked a lot about the intellect helping you away from your emotions, but we haven't very much talked about the intellect helping you into emotion. And the kind of thing you just suggested is a way to use the intellect to actually help you into the emotion rather than out of it. See, if you have a belief in your soul that you want to get to the emotion, you can now use your intellect, and that intellect is a tool God gave you to use to help you connect into the emotion. Now, um, Brian, you, you had a similar experience really with your intellect, using your imagination, wasn't it? And this was a case for yourself, You're using your imagination, imagining certain things, and uh, your spirit guide prompted you with the rabbit hole of analogy, right? And so you went with that, and then the thought came to you to dive down one, and straight away you were starting to get into the emotion. That whole thing happened through your intellect being motivated, but under, underlying that was a desire, a real desire, to actually get into the emotion. See, a lot of times what we do is we tell ourselves we have a desire, but it's not until we really try, like you've done there, where you walk for 14 kilometres or whatever it was, before you get to the last few kilometres where you're actually connected. It's often not, not until we really try or really seek that we get the emotion. So we've got to be really sincere with ourselves. Brian? Hey Jay, can I relate that to you? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, at the last meeting, I asked a, a question of Jay about uh, trying to get in touch with my childhood experiences, which weren't traumatic, but there was very subtle suppression of them. And, um, my earliest memory was of um, being well dressed, well behaved, being held by an adult stand in a store, and people commenting on how well I how well behaved I was and well dressed. And I tried to touch, get in touch with this. AJ gave an answer. I wrote out the whole transcription of what he said and really looked at it, and it had to do with judgment as well. With judgment. Um, I was given a chance to go on, on a retreat. Um, and the way I actually got to this and then beyond it, and I've had no success, was to try and use my intellect to imagine this little boy being in a store in this situation and what it felt like for the little boy to not to be able to go and run around and play and do what it felt like. And um, the first thing I felt was I could feel myself coming out of a state of like freedom as a little kid into feeling judgment and it was like a feeling of loss of innocence and there was grief associated with that and it progressed from there. That, that, I actually had to use my intellect in the form of imagination to even begin and after that it got, I started shaking, uh, crying, Talking to mum about all sorts of things happening from that, but I had to, I had to get, use that to mm. That's it. So, um, in the, I've written some stuff that was posted on the net, and I'm not sure where it is now. Um, I think it's called under, under Divine Love, Repentance, and Forgiveness, and I think it's under those sections. But I actually outline the process of intellectual realization and then the process of soul realization. And the majority of us need to go through an intellectual realisation before we go through soul realisations. The reason why is because we're using our intellect so heavily to deny that we often are skipping out of the emotion. So we've got to first have the realisations intellectually. Now one, in one realisation intellectually that's really important for you to have, it's really important for you, Carol, in this case, to have, is my law of attraction tells me the truth all the time. That's a really important intellectual realization there. My law of attraction tells me the truth all the time. Every single the front, the front lights are at least I can see that. Frustration, by the way, this is very important. Frustration, we'll talk about frustration again tomorrow. Frustration though leads you to mountains of emotions. Trust me. 
Now, in, in Peter's case here, the frustration was they're not speaking loud enough. Right? First thing, they're not speaking loud enough, kicks in. Then where does he go? He tries to correct it. Right? So he went over to try to correct it. Then this went off, another frustration. Right? Can you see how your law of attraction is creating frustration events? I can see. <laughs> Okay, I accept what you're saying, but I, I don't know what to do with that. Okay. Can you speak up a bit, please? <laughs> Good soul interaction. <laughs> so, so what do we do with this? What we usually do is lay, the, the projection was, they need to speak up louder. <laughs> so where does the frustration get focused? Oh. For you, sir, if I'm talking. It's getting focused externally. Something has to change. The reason why is because you don't want to have to do what you seem to have to do to correct the issue. And there's very big childhood events connected with this frustration. <laughs> really? Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, we could easily skip over frustration events. Most of us do, actually. Yeah. Don't we? How many times is it something mildly frustration? Oh, well, you just, in a way you go something else. Dismiss it constantly. We generally dismiss frustration events more than we dismiss almost any other events. Yeah. How many of us like feeling frustrated? Yeah. Not a very nice feeling. So the key is to go deeper into it and uh, start asking yourself what's related. This is very much related to your childhood, actually. Yeah, and some childhood emotion. And you know there's been many frustration events for you over the past three or four months coming at you. Plenty. Plenty. Yeah. So the key I is... Never, I never get any further. Exactly. I, I can notice myself getting frustrated and I go, oh, wow, I'm really frustrated about this. And then I get to a dead end. I'm just reflecting. What's the next step? I've acknowledged it here. Start feeling the frustration. What do we normally do with judgment of that? We don't want to feel frustration. But if you're already frustrated, aren't you feeling the frustration? Uh, frustration covers huge amounts of anger. And, and, and we need to step into that anger. So it's not to feel the frustration because you already are, it's to go deeper. Yeah, by saying that we're observing our own frustration, but we're not allowing any deeper emotion. Right? And it's the deeper emotion, it's the, the frustration will cover some really, really big emotions. Really big emotions. Often of even rage. Often you'll actually step down and step down and so, actually get to rage. Master, what would you have done in my situation? <laughs> Firstly, I don't know if I can answer a question starting with master. Uh, <laughs> I'm teasing you. <laughs> All right, so, oh wow, well, I'm really frustrated, is an observation. It's not actually feeling the emotion, it's an observation. It's an intellectual observation. Now allow myself to really sit in the emotion. So take time out now to sit down by yourself. Go back over this event in your feelings now and feel the frustration. And then allow, I'm allowed to be angry. You keep saying this, I'm allowed to be angry. I'm allowed to be frustrated. I'm allowed to be angry. I'm allowed to be enraged. If that's how I'm feeling inside, I'm allowed these emotions. Start allowing yourself to feel them. At the moment, there's some very strong judgments in you because of the lots and lots of training that you've had. To, to get over the frustration events intellectually, to skip them over. Remember, we've talked about that privately. Where, you know, so we're here at this point, and we skip over and we become calmer here, but there's all this emotion inside that we just didn't process. And it's still there, of course, still creating every frustration event. And that's why we keep getting frustration event, frustration event, frustration event, over and over and over and over and over again, until we get out of, oh, well, I'm really frustrated, 
down, you know, oh, well, I'm really angry. And oh, well, like, I'm one of bash the thing, and you actually go out and do that. You know, you actually go out, get the baseball bat on the punching bag, and away you go. And you yell and scream and swear and, and allow yourself to experience the frustration. And then when you do that, you'll find within, usually within a few minutes, like for me, it's usually within 10 seconds, I'm in the grieving emotion. And then usually I just collapse and then I'm in the grieving emotion. So it's rare, rare now for me to go through that. But uh, I knew one guy who took three weeks doing that, four hours a day before he felt his first grieving emotion. He was totally detuned from all emotion. No, was, his name's Nate. He was totally detuned from all emotion and it took him four hours a day, two hours in the morning, two hours every night. He actually went out to this pump, a punching man. Actually, you can buy these neoprene rubber men, right? <laughs> that you fill with water. You seen those? They're, they're pretty expensive. I think they're about 800 bucks or something. And, but, but they're really great in that when you punch them, they sort of flip back at you and everything. There's, there's a bit of a reaction in there as well. And, uh, and he would get there with a bat and then punch him back. And, and he would get to the point of exhaustion but still not connect with the emotion. And he did that for three weeks before he connected with the first emotion. And what connected him was the night before we talked about how much he was resisting because of his judgment. And once we talked about that, the next day I went into it and got into the emotion, the grieving emotion. And that's what you'll need to do. Step down into the frustration, into the anger, into the rage that's there, and really, really go for it then. But at the moment there's a lot of judgment. There's a judgment of I'm not being spiritual if I'm in this state of rage. I'm not, you know. It's not, it's not something that I want to experience, is also some of the feelings coming from you. you know, you've been taught through much of your life that you can choose your experience. This is a very new age philosophy, right? That you can choose to feel good. You don't have to feel bad, you can choose to feel good. You know? my, my answer to that is, if you're making a choice to feel good, then you are already not feeling exactly what you're feeling. Because you'll get to a point in the future where every feeling you have is blissful and you won't. And then we start feeling, <coughs> excuse me, we start feeling some. How many of you want to have a drink? Yeah, I just, I said I'd stop in an hour and it's an hour and 20 already. Um, keep going, have a drink. There's only a few that are saying have a drink, so keep going is going to be the way. Alright, so judgment. We go into judgment, right? And that often is... Once we get past some judgment, we then start getting into some emotions. So we start feeling some emotions. And you know, most of the time, when we first begin feeling emotions, the biggest single feeling that we generally have is I'm going nuts. How many of you have felt you're going nuts? First time you went in, you're going nuts. Okay. So then the judgment comes back, doesn't it? This is crazy. What's AJ doing to me? Like, this is nuts. What, you know, my life was so calm before, it was so manageable, I was fine. What, what is this man doing? Why am I attracted to him? I've got no idea. And you go through all this cycle, right? How many of you have experienced that already? Quite a few. Good. Well, that's normal. That's normal. That's good. That's actually good. The reason why it happens is because we're just we are so used to doing everything in this blinkered way that we've had all of our life that the first set of emotions we have feel like we're out of control. The idea in the end is you're going to be out of control full time. <laughs> but they're all going to be good. Out of control. Yeah. Does that, that make sense? I'm, I'm serious, I know it's funny, but I'm serious. You will be out of control all the time, but out of control will be feeling good all the time. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, okay. that's, that's, why, that's why we're still here. Yeah, that's why you're still here. You're hoping sometime down the track that might happen. <laughs> right. Now what happens in this state is we usually get into this place of, of terror. 
most of us have it in us. We are terrified of being crazy. We are terrified of going nuts. We are terrified, in reality what we are terrified is just being ourselves. But this feels like this. If you could draw a drawing, again my normal stick figure style. Here's terra firma. Here's the cliff. Here's little old me. Every one of you on the divine path will get to this place. Where it feels like if you go forward, you're going to fall off the edge of reason. Every one of you will go to this place at some point. And you know what most do when they're at that place? They turn around and head back to what they were doing before. It's very hard also to stay there. Can you imagine? It's like, imagine if you had, what's that fear of heights called? Vertigo. 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 Imagine you just stood on the edge of a cliff that's a thousand feet drop right in front of you. How many of you would go right to the edge and just stand there with your feet at the edge, your toe right at the edge and just look down? Not many of us would do that. Would we? But this is what you're doing emotionally. And it's quite a scary place to be. To be in that place where you're just standing on this edge looking down. It's going to be very, very hard for you to stay in that position too, isn't it? Can you see that? It's going to be, it's either one or two choices at this point now, isn't it? If one is going right and just falling off of it, or the other is walking away, stepping back, stepping back. Now what happens I find when most people get to this point, they step back, then it doesn't feel good again. They feel like they've lost ground. They, so they step forward, but they get to the edge of... And then they step back, and then they step forward. And I've seen people go through this process for three, four, five years even. Right? Step forward, no, step back, step forward. And many of the spirits here in this room with us today have gone through this process for tens or even hundreds of years. Stepping forward, stepping back, stepping forward, stepping back. You can see why it's a terrifying place to be at that edge. When you actually allow this to happen, <laughs> when you allow that to happen, what actually happens is for the first time in your life, you begin to rely on God. Really rely on God. That's the first time in your life that you're really going to rely on God. Up until that point, you're just talking about it, trust me. Right? When you throw yourself off the edge is when you really begin to rely on God. Now, throwing yourself off the edge is not a process of sort of like self-destruction. It's an emotional process that needs to happen inside of each of us. Where we become totally open to all of our emotions without judgement. And we become totally open to God, and we become totally open to our law of attraction. At that point. Before that point, we are always going back, forward, back, forward, back, forward. Or we're stepping towards that point. Now the walk towards that point is about dealing with what I would call blockages. Blocks. So up until that point, what you're often doing and this is why many of you feel at times, oh, I'm not really making any progress. Like, I haven't had a major emotional release in the last hour, so... <laughs> no, no, I mean, the last, most of us, it's the last three weeks or four weeks. Or we, we feel like we haven't had a major re emotional release for some time. And so then we set into judgment about that, don't we, generally? We say, oh, you know, what's going on? What's blocked here? I can feel this block, but I don't really know what's happening. And we get into this state where... Um, we're actually feeling we're not making progress. How many of you have felt that? Where you're not making progress, be frustrated. That's a judgment. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah, so there's another judgment. Anyway, so... so It could be the truth. It could be. <laughs> it could be the truth. But judgments are rarely truth. Is it, I'll speak loud. Is it only a judgment if we go that the block is bad? 
And no, sometimes our blockages can actually be what we view to be good experiences. For instance, we might be holding on to a family member that, that we really, really love, and so by holding on to this family member, we may know that that family member is going to condemn us if we make the next step, and so we're holding on to something that we believe is good. So blockages can often be stuff that we believe is good, no, but that's not what it, you meant. No, it's not. It's just like recognising a block yeah. need not be a judgement. Oh, of course. Yeah. Nothing. Remember, I'm saying nothing should be a judgement right. in the end. Yeah. Block, blocks are just, if we, if we judge our blocks, then we've got another layer on top yeah. of them blocks, yeah? It's far better just to see them as blockages. I think that's what Peter might have meant when he said it was the truth. That yeah. There is a block that yeah. So blockages are things that we need to release. Blockages are often in the form of beliefs. Do you know what I mean by beliefs? Like, how many of you believe that your life is out of your control? really here, you know. Most of us do at some point believe that. Uh, how many of you believe that your life is in somebody else's control? Many of us believe that, don't we? Well, if we believe in authority, we, we do, like with Carol. Yeah. Definitely. Certainly. And how many of us believe that the law of attraction happens to me because God's a punishing God? A lot of us have had that belief, haven't we? Many of, us, many of you have that belief right now and you're not going like this actually. But many of you have that belief inside of yourself. Right? And the reason why is because in our childhood, our parents were punishing every time. They judged us as doing something bad. They then usually punished us for doing that bad thing. And so now we have these beliefs. Now, blockages are often in the form of beliefs and you need to allow yourself to release them before you process the emotion. In other words, you need to come to realisation of the beliefs that you have that are blocking your emotion. So how many of you believe that if you cry, everyone will look down on you? If you cry here? Now let's ask the question, if I cried at work? Right, so you can see how one, like here you might feel more comfortable, right? Because we're talking about emotions. But at work, a lot less comfortable, yes? How many of you would find it easy to yell and scream and rage, bash in a thing, if you were at work? Do you reckon we... You have a punching bag here, right? Awesome. In the end, I can... In the end, I think that that the majority of workplaces in the world will finish up having punching bags, <coughs> baseball bat, you know, all these different methods of helping you deal with your rage. At the moment, that's not the case, though, is it? So, so we get very uncomfortable with dealing even with our blockages. The key is to understand, oftentimes these periods of time where we're not feeling an emotion is the period of time when you're actually dealing with a blockage and you're not conscious of it. The key is to become conscious of it. To become conscious of this period being a time when you're actually dealing with a block and to ask yourself what the block is. Is it judgment? Is it resistance? Is it whatever it is that's causing you to stay away from your emotions? Allow yourself to become conscious of your own blockages. Make sense? Let yourself do that. When you become conscious of your own blockages and you deal with blockages, you're stepping further and further towards the precipice. Sounds inviting, <laughs> doesn't it? Stepping further and further towards the precipice and then eventually, once you've dealt with almost all of your blockages except for the last blockages, which are usually, can I really trust God? Can I really trust myself? And can I really do this emotionally? Right? And once we get to that point, now we're at the precipice generally. Well, I've had a, well, three occasions in the past week or so where something 
minor goes wrong and minor response is panic. And then generally in the panic, I'm blaming somebody else. And then I'm coming back to, oh, if you'd only settle down and think it through, you'd be all right. And then, and then, and generally it does turn out to be all right when you figure out what the situation is. But, but, it, but it, the, the sort of jumping immediately to panic is something that I not really kind of get used to. In, in this case, my suggestion is now get yourself in an environment where you can go into the panic and really feel it. Because it is still bordering on the edges of the panic. And allow yourself to really experience the panic. Because it's a core childhood emotion in you. Um, so there's some events in your childhood that have caused terror-based emotions and you need to actually experience them to release them. So that's my suggestion in this case. You need to find a safe place. You need to be in a safe place, obviously. Yeah. So, you know, a room by yourself maybe that, you know, you can... Well, usually by myself. So yeah. There's no reason and to see it. Most um, there's a very good, I think, was it James, one of your spirit friends channeled to you a statement about emotions that they never can kill you. It's the resistance yeah. of emotions that kill you. Yeah. <laughs> so how many of you have felt like you're dying when you're feeling an emotion? How many of you felt like that? Quite a lot, I reckon. And, and that's a good sign, actually, that you're actually connecting with some true causal emotion. The key is to remember that you're not going to die from feeling it. You're going to die from denying it. So, so a lot of people worry, oh, I've got so much sadness and they're crying, they're crying, I'm going to have a heart attack now, right? Because it feels so gut, you know, heartfelt, terrible grief. In reality, it's relieving you from the potentiality of a heart attack. That's really what's going on. Tris? Thanks, mate. Do all people have the same intensity of emotions, AJ? Um, no. Because uh, everyone has different levels of sensitivity in the soul. Everyone, all, remember, all of us are different, right? So all of us have different levels of sensitivity. Also, as you grow in love, your sensitivity increases. So this was what you'll find happen in your processing too. That as you grow in love, your soul is growing in its capacity to experience emotion more sensitively. So you'll actually sometimes feel like you know, the emotion you're processing today was much more intense than the emotion you processed a year ago. And that's a good sign, actually, that your soul's becoming more sensitive. Not the other way around. Right? Again, we have often judgment about that. actually happening for you is that um, you're near this terror, right? And you're not being able to actually dive into the terror. And one thing that will help you do that is from now on to just keep telling yourself that you are terrified. In other words, have the, at least make the intellect now acknowledge this feeling that's there. And the more you acknowledge the feeling that's there, you'll get to a point that eventually you'll be able to experience the terror. It might be a week, it might be two weeks, you know, it might be a month, um, but you, you will get to the point where you experience the terror. The key is to be patient with yourself. Remember this terror is a big emotion, it's like a mountain for most of us, it's like a big monster that's going to kill you. And so the key is to just be honest about what the emotion is. Be patient with yourself too about what the emotion is. And this applies to all emotion, not just terror. So be be truthful. I have this hatred of men in me. I have this hatred of women in me. I'm scared of women who are angry. You know, and just write, I write them down. Like when I notice this is an intellectual realisation, I write them down and I keep reminding myself. Mary plasters it over the walls in the house. 
Like reverse affirmation. Reverse affirmation, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. And, and they are very helpful. What they do is they are stating the truth, reflecting the truth of how you really feel back to yourself. And eventually, when you do that, you will connect to the emotion. And that's all you will need to do. So every time now you get itchy, I am terrified. Every time the law of attraction is showing you, I'm terrified. Just remind yourself, I am terrified. I'm terrified I'm allowed to be terrified. And I'm allowed to deny my terror. A lot, a lot of times we, we don't allow ourselves to, cut, to do the opposite. What I found is very powerful, and I, and I still, uh, a lot of times, I can understand why it's powerful. But I was told a long, long time ago in my own emotional processing work was that you're allowed to choose to not feel something. And it's ironic that when you tell yourself that, often you go ahead and feel it anyway. Uh, how many of you have experienced that where you've told yourself, I'm, I am terrified and I'm allowed to choose to not feel it? And ironically, the next day you feel it. And the reason why is because it's a constant acknowledgement of the truth. Remember, it's the truth that unlocks the emotion. Right? So if you tell yourself lies, you are not going to unlock the emotion. You must tell yourself truths to unlock the emotion. Um, I'm curious on all the dealing with our things that are race of the earth. Like there's a new business, a new age business opening up, and all these emotions are going to be healed in one weekend workshop. Twelve hundred dollars sign up tomorrow. Probably. Yep, yep. Um, what the question is I have is, with your teaching and this legality, it seems universal that anyone can use this at home, driving a car, talking to your son. He's coming from work. It's the first day of high school. Yep. My son's going to experience in three days. Yes. And this is. There's like a mountain already building up on this. Is he going to come home with a black eye? Or is he going to come home with a, a red kiss on the side of his cheek? You know? And I'm wondering how much we put into this ourselves, apart from the fact that our children are doing this mirror thing. Is that an opportunity for me to go into my childhood with this and how it was for me when I started high school? Exactly. And we, like, we could release something and really bond together more? Yes. Instead of having to go and pay all this money to help get a better relationship with my children? Yes. And there'll be a talk I'll do soon about children and their reflections. But every single feeling your children have was created by yourself or your wife or you know whoever is surrounding them and they are reflecting it straight back at you. So it'll be related to your childhood, actually, what's going on there. So allow yourself to experience that, spot on. The, the other thing about all of these courses that are popping up everywhere, $1,200, and like you said, and, and you know, you'll get rid of it all in a weekend. It is totally impossible for your soul to get rid of everything in a weekend. But understandably so, isn't it? How many blockages, how many, like, like, we have mountains of it often. How, how can you expect to get rid of it in a weekend? Also, why are they charging you to get rid of your emotions, help you get rid of your emotions? Now, I'm not saying don't go. I'm saying do everything you want to do to connect you emotionally, but understand with, with the truth, with the divine truth, you can do this yourself at any time. God didn't create a system where only the people with the dollars are going to deal with their emotions. Well, that, that, that precludes two-thirds of the world population. Straight away, doesn't it? Two-thirds of the world population doesn't get enough to eat in a day, no matter do with anything else. Right? So, so God made this perfect system in you that any single person in any single socio-economic environment can deal with their causal emotion. And that's very, very important for you to understand. So I'm not saying don't go to these courses. You may learn things there, or many times more importantly, you may connect with people there who help you deal with your law of attraction emotions. But let yourself do this on a daily, hourly basis. Watch yourself going through this process. And you'll find you won't need those things. It becomes so simple in the end. All you need is your interactions. All you need is all of these things going on with your law of attraction. They tell you everything. 
they tell you everything. And all you need to do is set your intention for truth, personal truth, and you'll get it. How many have done that? Where you've set your intention the next day or the next hour, even. often happens like that. from the feeling that you know you're in this constraint where now you have complete freedom but it, but it but it does require confrontation of a lot of emotions to get to that place so getting to the place where you're willing to just fall off the edge emotionally and actually go into everything emotionally connect to God completely rely on God to, and, and, and your and your own soul to get you through the whole process that takes a lot of emotional processing to get to that point. And in the end, somebody just mentioned the word courage. Is that? Yeah, there is lots of courage too. Thanks for running around for interest. In a situation like the lady just described, can you, for example, remain in that situation? Deal with your emotions within yourself and still be able to live in that environment without any problems. Um, it's highly unlikely. The reason why, and this is something most of us need to come to terms with, and that is that as you deal with emotions, you will automatically need to make different choices based on the new state of love you're in. 
So, so once you get into a newer state of love or a greater state of love for yourself, love for others and love for God, you will actually make different choices. And you need to be prepared for that. Most people, I find, once they get on this path, they have this viewpoint of, oh, all right then, all I need to do is fill my emotions and everything will change around me and I won't have to do a thing. But that's not true either. Because most of your emotions, if you're thinking that way, are about you not wanting to do a thing <laughs> and wanting everything to change around you, which is not the way God made this system of this. Right? What he made it is so that you become a self-realized being connected to God, able to control, able to create anything you desire, which will mean in the end that you will actually choose to do things very differently. So he said that if the person I guess is that self-realization, then they change themselves. But also those that are around them will have that reflection. Can they not change to bring that situation back where the thing is harming? Yes, but it's highly unlikely if you expect that to happen it's highly unlikely it will happen. The reason why is because if we're expecting things of other people, then then obviously um, you know, there's a problem or a, a feeling inside of ourselves that needs to be released. But you are right in the sense that if I change my stuff inside of me, the people around me will begin to change as well. Now, some will change in a negative way, in other ways that they will condemn me. Others will change in a positive way in that they choose to follow the same kind of path. But either way, there will be changes around me automatically. So you will find that you'll get to a point, for example, you might be living in a relationship even, and then all of a sudden you get to the point where you're feeling, well, no, this relationship is not in harmony with love of myself. Or you realise that you're in the relationship for security and not for love. Right? Or you, you might realise lots of different truths about yourself in this process. And then you will need to act upon them. Because if you choose to not act upon them, you are in fact in a place of fear that needs to be confronted. Does everyone, yes. can everyone see that? So you will need to act differently on this path as you progress. It will be an automatic process though where you realise, I can't stay here anymore. So for example, with the thing you mentioned earlier about the job, the truth is up to that point where he said there's no more work for you, you were actually working in a job you didn't want anyway, right? And you weren't being truthful about that and creating something different. And this is what we often do. We often don't create something different because we're in a place of fear rather than in a place of love. And these are all lessons of love that we need to learn through this process. Right. Now, I just want to talk about the falling off. How many of you feel absolutely petrified, by the way, to do that? And you just yeah, quite a quite a number, and I understand. Um, I've had that same feeling. Um, your life will completely change when you do that, and it will change so rapidly that intellectually you will not be able to keep up with it. And you can see if I'm in my mind and I intellectually not being able to keep up with changes, then I'm going to want to get back onto this terra firma place, aren't I again? Can you see that? So you'll be in this place where you'll be quite terrified. Now the key is to shorten that place to be as short a period as possible. Right? The longer you make that place where you're standing on the edge, the harder it gets. Can you understand why? Because the fear is building, the terror is building. Can you see what you're doing? living in the terror, living in the fear of, of going further and you're not choosing to fall off into full reliance, into full trust in God. So my suggestion is to try to keep that place as short as you possibly can. Now, how do you do that? The first thing you do is pray like you've never prayed before. Remember when I talk about prayer, I'm talking about having a longing in your heart for God and in particular for God's love to enter you. So when I say pray, I'm saying talk to God about these feelings you have of fear and terror. Face them. Don't run away from them. Face them. Be honest about them. 
What am I afraid of? I'm afraid of losing all my friends. And then you see others that have fallen off and they have lost all their friends. So it seems valid, doesn't it? That fear. All right. I lost all mine, so you know, you're probably going to lose all yours too. And, and then, so you fall, you fall off into that. And what's that fear? You allow yourself to feel that. Feel why you don't want that. Allow yourself to feel these feelings. Pray to God. Remember, this is about your relationship with God. It's not about your relationship with anyone else. All your relationships with everyone else will change on a constant basis as you progress. New people will come into your life. People who don't like you anymore will leave your life. And people who will just lose interest in you. And if you remain connected with the God and keep progressing towards God, you will finish up having more and more and more friends. But many of them may not be here on earth. <laughs> you might have more friends in the spirit world, but not as many here on earth, right? Because there are less people here on earth currently in the state of a, of a higher degree of love, if you like. So, so you may finish up initially losing friends. But then you'll find, after a while, things will start changing and more and more people will start being attracted to you because they see this love being reflected in your life. They see your joy and so they then feel it's contagious and they want to know. And then things will start shifting in another direction as you've dealt with those causes and emotions inside of yourself that caused the rejection in the first place. But if you don't connect to God, you're going to feel totally alone. Totally alone. And that's why your connection with God is so important. Because when you've got that, you are never alone. Right? And this is the area where your connection with God is going to be tested. And when I say tested, what I mean is that you're going to have to put your full reliance in God to get beyond that point. And every one of you will face that point. Every single one. Some of you may have felt like you've already faced that point. Right? But every single one of you will face that point. So pray. Talk to God about where you're at. Be honest and truthful. And that's the second thing. Is always focus on the truth. God created my soul. Basic truth this is. God created my soul. Therefore, God knows how to protect me. I am his child, therefore, God knows how to protect me. No, but you're, th you're thinking it, not feeling it. There's a big difference between being in this state here and being in this state here. Look at your law of attraction. Your law of attraction, remember, tells you the truth of where you really are, not where you think you are. Many of you will think that you're in a better condition spiritually than you really are. That your law of attraction is telling you something totally different and you're ignoring it. Many of you are in that condition. Allow yourself to see the law of attraction as your truth. That is the truth being reflected back at you, telling you that there's an issue here, there's an issue there, and so forth. Right? Does that make sense to everyone? Because it's really important that you see the truth not from your perspective, but from God's respect. <coughs> There's a truth that I feel like I'm missing something with the way that God's creating creating souls. And say, for example, you know, they, they are in the pristine state and that they could end up in the Gaza Strip or end up in America or in my case, you know, incarnating and experiencing these, these things. And, you know, I know you said there's a mathematical, mathematical equation, the law of attraction, but I know that I'm missing something, that, and I'm not trusting that. You know, we're getting stuck in here to experience all this from, from a pristine place. Yeah. And why um, he continues with that, or is that? Then I sort of come to the point. Well, it's all free will, but I know, I know I'm missing something. Yeah. The, the issue you haven't faced yet emotionally is that man has created this environment, not God. See, but most, of it, most of us don't face the fact that what we blame God for, really, man is the creator, not God. There are lots of things in the universe God didn't create. And one of them is like a wars. God doesn't create them. Man creates them by their choices. Right? God created the potentiality of them existing. 
that's all, by giving man free will. And there's a soul feeling that you need to connect with about that. So there's a feeling inside of you towards God that God shouldn't have done that. And that's, so go into that emotion. Allow yourself to feel about that. Get enraged with God if you need to. Get out and punch your bag and, do the, and yell and scream and swear at God about Him creating this system. But in the end, when you release that emotion, you have a realisation. And that realisation will be that actually man created this system, not God. I, I know I'm missing something there, but I'm not quite getting it yep. again. Yeah. Now, all you need to step off of this is prayer and truth and one other quality love of yourself even a smidge of love of yourself will do it <laughs> why? because if you really love, if you really begin to love yourself what will happen is you will realize that actually what anybody else thinks of you is really immaterial isn't it? you won't realize it here because many of you have already told yourself that here right? but you'll actually feel it here you will feel that it doesn't matter anymore what anybody thinks of you and you'll feel that enough to just fall off the edge into trust of God and so my suggestion is and I'm going to finish the discussion now my suggestion is notice where you are in your own progression and if you find yourself hitting this edge place where you're getting quite afraid or terrified or so forth, allow yourself to see the truth about what's going on inside of yourself and allow yourself to focus on the things that are going to help you move through this place, into this place of fully trusting God. When you do that, your emotions after that time will come thick and fast. But you will also have lots of joyful events happen thick and fast. Right? Up until that point, you're going to feel like your life is a nightmare and you feel like you have no joy whatsoever. Yeah? Many of you have felt that already, right? Where you've got to that point where you're feeling like, wow, you know, sure, this feels like it's the truth, but gee whiz, like, you know, can I handle this terrible experience? It's because of the fact that we're releasing the blocks that we're going through that. Once we get to this edge of falling off, you'll get into a place where it, you have many, many joyful experiences in the process of processing your own emotion. But before that time, most of the time it gets to be a bit nightmarish when it comes to dealing with your emotion. So the reason why I wanted to discuss that with you today was because I wanted to give you forewarning of what will be coming up in your lives if you choose to keep following the path of divine love. And what I'm finding is that many have ran away before I've had the chance to tell them or warn them of what might happen. So what I want to do is allow you to, you know, just inform you that these things will probably happen in your life and not to become so afraid that you feel like you need to run away, but rather allow yourself to just fall off the edge eventually and work through the emotions that prevent that from occurring. Right. Well, time for a break, I think, huh? So uh, we'll come back about 3 30 ish, um, and the discussion is reincarnation. Why well, you guys take a long half hour break? Yeah. I hate to employ you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, this session is about reincarnation, and uh, it sounds like a very non-emotional subject to discuss, perhaps. <laughs> but the reason why I wanted to discuss it with you today is that uh, I've only discussed the issue once before, and it was quite some time ago, around nearly two years ago now. And uh, of course a lot of people have heard a lot of these things over and over again but not heard them first hand from myself. And also that uh, there are a lot of times that the reincarnation beliefs that are on earth still affect people in their emotional processing work. And so I wanted to discuss this issue with you quite a lot. 
One of the other reasons I wanted to discuss the issue too is that for many people, the belief in reincarnation is actually preventing them from accessing their core emotions. And the reason why is that uh, they start attributing a lot of their emotions to previous experiences. And, and then that's the tendency to distance themselves from their current emotion. And so I'd like to talk to you about all of the negative effects of an inaccurate belief in reincarnation. But I want to say up front that there is reincarnation, but it's not like it's taught in any current theology on earth. And, and it's very important at some point for you to understand it if you want to progress to the soul union state of the uh, in the spirit world. And it's very important to understand some of the limitations, or lots of the limitations actually, that exist around the current beliefs that are on earth. And how much of the current beliefs are unloving, in fact. And we'll talk about that during this discussion. Now, everyone should have been given a bit of a handout, which is basically just the notes that I've written, in summary, of what we will discuss. And I also emailed to everyone, uh, a very long document, a hundred page document, uh, I think it was, uh, which you can read if you want, which discusses more things in detail than what I'm going to mention today. So you enjoy that, Carol, that's good. Yeah. The, the important thing with all of this discussion is that, that I'd like to say up front is, it is not important if you believe in reincarnation or not. That's a... <coughs> So I'll say that again, it is not important whether you believe in reincarnation or not. What is important is that you understand the importance of processing and being in your emotions if you want to connect with God. Your belief in reincarnation, if you have one, will change markedly over your, your progression. And I can guarantee to you, in fact, that you'll get to a point in the eighth sphere of the spirit world, or here on earth, if you get to that point here on earth, that your belief in reincarnation will be almost completely different to a belief that you may have had at some time before here on earth, you know, up until we've met, perhaps. And I know for many of you that many of you still have a strong belief in reincarnation. And, uh, and that is your prerogative. And I'm not here to condemn that. I'm just here to state what the truth is about. And and a lot of people project straight back at me the thing, oh, well, that's your truth. And I can say to you categorically that you will find at some point that what I will present to you is actually God's truth about reincarnation. But that being said, you are totally entitled to have your own belief. And my suggestion is even after this discussion, if you still have that belief, don't neglect your emotional work. Don't put off dealing with your emotions just because you don't agree with this subject or what I'm going to present on this subject. Does that sound fine? Yes. Okay. So that being said, how many of you feel that reincarnation still, you know, general reincarnation as it's taught in, say, Hindu and Buddhist philosophies and New Age philosophies, you still feel very drawn to that teacher? How many of you feel that? So there's some. Okay. How many of you are starting to feel like it doesn't really matter anyway? Right? Okay. So a lot, a lot of you are feeling that way. So why are we here? <laughs> <laughs> I could go surfing this afternoon. <laughs> no, just kidding. Do I need to explain, in the outline that I've given you, of the introduction explains what the beliefs of reincarnation are. Do I need to explain those things to you? Or do you feel fairly firm about that you understand the differing beliefs in reincarnation that are on earth? Can you see how many different religious formats on earth believe in this belief of reincarnation? Um, notice I put it there in the introduction. Right, you know, obviously the majority of the Indian traditions, even things like you know, modern pagans, New Age movement, spiritism, African <coughs> traditions, Kabbalah, Sufism, and all these other types of movements, they all have a teaching in them of reincarnation of some kind. And 
I must say that I never believed in reincarnation. Until, um, until about the 1940s, actually, was the first time that I believed in reincarnation myself. And that in itself was an interesting process for me in the spirit world when I was there, going through the process of accepting some of these beliefs because I now knew how it could occur. Before then I didn't know how it would occur and so I didn't believe in reincarnation at all. And particularly I didn't believe in reincarnation that was taught here on earth. And I still don't believe in that form of reincarnation. However, we need to look at things not from what we believe or don't believe, but we need to look at everything from a condition of love. So what we need to do when we're analysing these beliefs of reincarnation that exist on earth is to look sincerely at them from the point of view of love. Is it loving for God to have this kind of enforcement, if you like, of reincarnation on the earth? What kind of love does it display? If we analyse everything from the point of view of love, we can usually get to the truth of it very rapidly. So does everyone understand that principle? If you look at it from a point of view of love, then truth is often very, very quickly arrived at.